Okay, welcome back after break. Just before we went for our break, we were looking at Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. No audio? Can you hear me now? Now is it okay? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so here we said we said that we, we can learn many things from Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it says that we need to prove what is God's will. God, God reveals his will, but we need to do our part. There is something that we need to play a part, just like we need to, we said we need to cooperate with God to know his plan and will. When he reveals his plan and will, we also need to prove it. That means we need to test. We need to examine if this is God's plan, will for our lives. Okay, it's very important. Okay, so we need to prove and test if this is God's plan and perfect will for our uh, lives. So for us to know God's good, acceptable and perfect will for our lives, what do we need? We need a... What do we need? What does this verse say? A renewed mind. Okay? A renewed mind is necessary for us to be able to prove, test, or examine the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. God. Okay? So what is a renewed mind? When we say a renewed mind, what do we mean? Renewed mind, what do we mean? Simple it is. Look at the word renewed. Renew mind. That means we have a mind, but we re need to re remake it into a new mind, so to say. Why? Why should we make a mind new? Why should we make our mind new? Why should we have a fresh way of thinking? Thank you, Charles. So that you can know the perfect will of God, okay? Sanjay says, change old patterns of thinking. Align our mind with God's word. Thank you. Very good. Lucy says, to know good and bad. Yes. Because when we are born again, we are born again in our... Where are we born again? In our... Spirit man. You know, we're made up of our spirit man. We're made up of three things. What? Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. Each of us are made of spirit, soul, and body. You know what is your spirit, right? Your spirit is the one is born again, and your spirit your spirit connects with the Holy Spirit with God. Okay? And what is your soul? Your soul is made up of your mind. Heart is what? Emotions and your will. The soul is made of your mind, will, and your emotions. And this is your body. Your body is how your spirit accesses the Holy Spirit, has access to the Holy Spirit and God. And then it's put into your mind and your body gets into action. Okay? So, Charles, thank you. Uh, yes, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay? So we need to renew our minds means what? We need to take a renewed mind takes on the higher ways and the higher thoughts of God. A renewed mind means a mind that takes on the ways and the thoughts of God. Please write that down so you know what a renewed mind is. A renewed mind is a mind that takes on the thoughts and the ways of God. Okay. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8 and 11 says, God says, My ways are not your ways, neither are my thoughts your thoughts. Okay. So a renewed mind is a mind that is learning to take on the higher ways and the higher thoughts of God. 
So we need a renewed mind to be able to prove, or examine, or determine what's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Okay. Now the other thing we can learn in this verse is this: this verse teaches us that there, uh, you know, people say that this verse tells us that there are three categories of God's will. Okay, but that is not true. There are no three categories of God's will. God's will is all good, acceptable, and perfect. There are no different categories. So that means people say, hey, for some, for, for some, God's will is good. For some, God's will is perfect. Some, God's will is acceptable. No. Okay? There are no three categories or classifications of God's will. God's will is, he just, Paul is just using three adjectives. That means he's using three words to describe God's will. And how is God's will? God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. Every will of God for you is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, what does the word good mean? The word good in the Greek means whatever is excellent, upright, and honorable. Okay? Anything that is good uh, is anything that is excellent, upright, and honorable. What is the meaning of acceptable? Whatever is fully agreeable by God. That means when God's will, he's giving you your will, he's giving you what is honorable, what is excellent, what is upright. He's giving you what he agrees with. That is the meaning of acceptable. And perfect means without any flaw. Flaw means what? Not even yes. one small mistake. Okay, not even one small mistake. Okay, so just imagine God's will for your life is excellent upright, honorable, it agrees fully with God, and it is a, a will that is without any mistakes or flaw. Okay, So a renewed mind is able to quickly test and analyze, prove and discern if something is good, acceptable, and perfect. And then we know, hey, this is God's will for my life. Okay, But how do we get to having this renewed mind? mind or how do we get there how do we have a renewed mind how are we able to test and know if this is god's good acceptable and perfect will look at what ephesians chapter 5 verse 10 says ephesians chapter 5 verse 10. finding out what is acceptable to lord finding out what is acceptable to god now the word acceptable is the same word used here that we see in Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 2. So the same word, acceptable, a Greek word for also proof, testing what is acceptable to the Lord. So as a believer, it's your responsibility to prove, to test, to find out what is acceptable to God. So we need to do that, okay? Look at what Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 tells us. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Anyone would like to read that, please? But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Yes. So Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14 tells us how this happens. Okay, it says that solid food. Now, what is the solid food here? What is the writer of Hebrews referring solid food to? The word of God. Yes, thank you. The word of God. Thank you, Charles. So the word of God is the solid food. And it says the word of God belongs to whom? Look at your, your books or your Bibles. Who does the word of God belong to? Those who are full age, that means those who are 60, 70, 80, 90 years. What does it mean, full age? Those who are mature, okay, mature, which means those who are constantly using their minds, their senses to know what is right and 
wrong. They use their studying God's word, they're meditating on God's word, they you constantly losing their mind they're, to discern what is right and wrong, what is good and what is evil. Okay, so we all need to come to that place. We can be very soulish, we can be very carnal, that means we can think in our flesh, we can think like the world thinks. But we need to come to a place where we are using God's word to know what is right, what is wrong, and do what is right and not do what is wrong. Okay. So how do we get to that place of being mature? How do we come to a place where we are mature to know what is right and wrong, to do what is right and wrong? How do we come to a place of maturity where we are having a renewed mind? When we are constantly using the word of God, to the constant use of God's word, which means for everything we have to go back and think, hey, what does God want me to do in the situation? Okay, somebody said something negative to me. I want to react to them. I want to give them back. But what does God's word tell me? Don't give back evil for evil, but repay evil for good. I'm always forgiving this person. How many more times should I forgive this person? It's a time I should give them good. But you stop and say, hey, what does the word of God tell me? What does the word of God tell me? I need to forgive somebody. How many times? 70 times seven that means uncountable times in numerous times you just you know excuse them so you know when you talk worthless things from your mouth jeremiah says god says if you repent of your sins and if you don't talk worthless things and talk worthy things then i will use you to speak my word okay so god wants us to speak things that are worthy Okay, if you're not somebody who's gentle, always rude, very rash, what does the word of God say? Gentle and a quiet spirit is great worth in God's sight. If you get some angry very fast, you lie. What does the word of God say? It says seven things are detestable to God, a lying tongue. See? So you know what God's word is and you exercise that, you use that every day, which means you are able to become mature, come to full age, mature in your understanding, and also you are having a renewed mind, okay? So how do we get to that place? We constantly use the word of God. Then we get our senses trained to know what is good and evil, okay? So it's important for us to feed on God's word. It's important for us to chew on God's word. You know what a cow does? You know, what does a cow do? What does a cow do? Gai kya karti hai? Bhez kya karti hai? Jab ghas ko khati hai, no? When the cow eats grass, what does it do? It swallows everything up. And then it brings it out and slowly it will be chewing. So you always see the cow doing. Its mouth will always be moving, but there'll be no grass that it's eating because it's bringing out the thing that it has eaten. The same way, that is meditation. Meditation is not, you know, I get up in the morning, I have to, all of you have to get up at five o'clock, right? So you have to do your meditation. You read something, you're sleeping. Oh, I finished. I read my Bible for today. If he ask you what you read, what did I read? You know, yeah, I think I read this. What did you read in that? I really don't know. So meditation is you read something, but throughout the world, day you are thinking about the same thing that you have read. Okay, so it's constantly using God's word. It is speaking God's word. It is meditating on God's word. It is applying God's word. Okay, and then when you do that, you know you have your senses trained to know what is good and evil. Okay, and at some point in your life. You will be able to quickly approve or prove what is good, accepting, and perfect will of God because your mind is trained to study God's word or to move according to what God's word tells us. Now, let's look at some examples, practical examples, okay, to see how God's word, we can apply God's word in our 
lives. Okay. Now, many of you here um, uh, are young people. You would want to get married soon. Anyone here married? In-person student? Oh, one person is married. Okay. Many of you want to get married. Okay. All of you are young. Some of our um, online students, you also are uh, married or unmarried. Okay. So let's look at some practical examples. How can we use these? Um, you know, uh, nine guideposts or one or two we can look. So suppose you're considering marriage. Now, if you were in 10 standard, would you consider marriage? No, because one of the guideposts that we would be looking at, uh, studying one of them, is recognize the time and seasons. God works in times and seasons. 10 standard is not a time and season God wants us to get married. Okay, But if you are in the age where you want to get married, then some of you will be in this place, you're wondering, hey, should I get married? Okay. Then what does God's word say? What does God's word say? God's word says in Genesis chapter 22, verse 24, that it's God's will for every man and woman to be married. Okay. So if you want to know, hey, is, is it God's will and plan for my life to get married? Yes, it is because Genesis chapter 2, verse 24 says, it's God's will for every man and woman to be married. But if God specifically tells you, hey, I don't want you to get married, then it's a different thing. Okay. So now this is, we've gone past the first hurdle or first obstacle that God wants us to get married. Now, second thing is you need to find a life partner. Okay. So when you come to that age, you're looking, you know, you look, uh, you find some Mr. Handsome or Miss Beautiful and uh, you think, hey, this is the perfect person for my life. You are looking at that person and you're very interested in that person and uh, you try to, you know, uh, please that person. And then slowly, you know, you're praying about it, you're thinking about it night and day that just that person is in your mind. Okay. Everything about that person you just like so much. And then you slowly slip a paper when the person is drinking coffee, keep it under their coffee mug. And, you know, you say, I love you. Can you get married to me? Blah, blah. You know, and then the person responds and you're very excited and you get to know each other. And, you know, love is just blossoming and you want to get married. Okay. And then you have to go to your parents and, of course, tell them and also to your, who else you have to go and tell? Parents and pastor right if you go to your pastor and tell him and then you say pastor here is you know a beautiful girl who i fell in love with and she's this she's that i prayed about it and god said yes angel gabriel came in the night angel gabriel told me this is the person for your life this is god's will i know it because this is the perfect person and all of my friends also say yes my parents are also happy so the pastor is, uh, you know, listening and saying, you know, and you're saying, this is the perfect person for me, pastor. So then pastor asks you a question. What is the question he asks you? Huh? What's the question pastor asks you? Is the person, is Mr. Handsome or is Miss Beautiful a believer? Yes. And then you are like, oh, no, this is not the question that I wanted my pastor to ask i wish i shouldn't have come here i shouldn't have told pastor i didn't want him to ask this question and then you are telling pastor i don't think i'm not too sure pastor i've not found out the love is so blind we just fell in love but we know this is a perfect person god has told me angel gabriel came and told me pastor saying all that is fine but look at what you know which opens 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, and tells you, read this. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 say? What does it say? Please read. It says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. That means we cannot be yoked. means, you know, yoke is when, when a farmer is farming, he puts two cows, bullock carts, and they, you know, put the wooden thing, they walk together, okay? So you cannot be yoked with an unbeliever. So the pastor says you cannot marry an unbeliever, okay? Why? Look at what Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says. What does Amos chapter 3 verse 3 say? Can somebody read that, please? And two walk together, 
unless they are agreed can two walk together unless they are agreed okay so here it says that you know of we need to be in spiritual harmony it's very important for us to live together and to walk to together and you're very disappointed you're very heartbroken you're very sad you leave pastor's office and saying i shouldn't have come here i shouldn't have spoken to pastor maybe i'll go and find another pastor who will get me married to this person and not ask me all these questions but this is what god's word says that you cannot be unequally yoked with another unbeliever okay now let's look at another topic divorce now some of you are married you know but um, your husband is not um, you you suddenly become very spiritual you attend fasting prayer you attend all the meetings you're very active in church but your husband is not you know inclined to the things of god and then you know he doesn't come along with you for meetings and all of those things so you go alone and suddenly you see this brother in church okay very handsome man he is very uh, uh, energetic he is too much for the things of god he is serving he is uh, doing things in the church and you start liking him you know saying you know and then you look at his hands fingers no ring oh he's not married okay so maybe god is has brought me to a place where he is bringing me spiritually He is helping me grow, and uh, you know my husband is not a spiritual partner anymore. He is not uh, growing in the things of God. So you know here is a man who is very spiritual. I can benefit. We both can do things together. Two is better than one in God's kingdom. You think all these things, all of these lies the enemy fills, and you are very happy. And you go to your pastor and you say, you know, pastor, you know. Um, want to marry this person but pastor says you are already married yes but you know my husband is not inclined to the things of god and i think i need to build god's kingdom to build god's kingdom i need a partner who is you know zealous for god passionate doing things and here is his brother and you go on and on and on and poor pastor is listening to you he so sad he turns to malachi chapter 2 verse 16 and look at what malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says what does god say in malachi chapter 2 verse 16 please look at your bible the book for the lord god of israel says that he hates divorce for it covers one garment with violence says the lord of hosts therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously yes what does the word of god say the word of god says god hates divorce god hates divorce that means what you know god is not a god who hates thing he is a god of love hate means it's totally detestable to him he just can't stand it okay that is what hate means so you know so the pastor says uh sister suzy you know is your present husband ever committed adultery so sister suzy says i wish he did pastor it would have been good for me so that i can divorce him and marry this man that's the problem he is not he's been very faithful and then the pastor says has your husband ever left you then sister suzy says no pastor that's another problem he never leaves me he's always there he's very faithful so pastor says then why do you want to divorce him okay but here the sister suzy wants to marry another brother but what does god's word say god's word says he hates divorce okay so god will never tell us to do anything that contradicts his word some of us and can say hey god brought this non christian person into my life he brought her with a or him with a plan and purpose so that i can i can change her i can bring her to you know the lord no no god does not go against his word god will not do anything that goes against his word so you can't say god brought this non christian girl or this non christian man in your life so that you can marry them and lead them to christ no god will never do that okay because god says do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers god cannot go back on his word okay let's look at few more examples you know about our thoughts and you know about talking unrighteous things so say for example you know you're very young 
and you say you come to your pastor with a bag of money and you open the bag of money and say pastor i want to give this money as tight and the pastor is looking at you and saying hey where did you get all this money so he says you know what pastor i was traveling on my bike and i was speaking in tongues suddenly i saw this atm it was open they were uh, loading the atm with money suddenly this plan came up in my mind you know i just took the knife i went in it was a blunt knife but i scared these people they just gave me all the money and i brought it and i'm you know i'm going to use it for this business and this is my tithes part of the money for us tithe to the church okay and what does the poor pastor say look at what he opens ephesians chapter 4 verse 28 what does he say in, what does it say in ephesians chapter 4 verse 28 Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who who has need. Just let him who steal steal no longer. So, first thing, I don't care if it's a big amount, a small amount. The fact is that you should not steal any longer. And God said, you know what you have done is sin, and I cannot take this money as tight offering for the. Church. The Bible says uh, that you know God leads us in paths of righteousness. Okay, you know nowadays uh, or in this world we live in, there's good lie and bad lie. Some people say some lie is good when you sorry when you tell a lie that can save somebody, it's a good lie. And some lie is bad, but for God there's no good lie and bad lie. A lie is a lie. A sin is a sin okay we can't compromise on that okay so when we are walking in paths of righteousness god leads us but when we are walking in paths of unrighteousness the lord is not in front of you he is not leading you okay another thing that uh, is not in your books but i like to just talk about it is choosing your career you know what choosing what thing to do in life you know for some of us we want to become uh, go into this industry of uh, entertainment you know or fashion designing or advertising and we think sometimes is it right for a believer to be in fashion designing advertising or acting what do you think is it right for a believer to be in these fields advertising fashion designing no pastor or, no okay thank you no. get through Charles says yes. Yes, a believer, a Christian can be involved in all of these industries. Now, Jesus never said, "Be a light in the nice places in the world, and other places let them stay in darkness." What does Jesus say? He says, "You are the light of the world." Where is light? Light necessary? If there's already light in this room, we don't need any more light, right? We need only light in a dark. place okay so we can as believers be in the places of entertainment fashion industry and advertising but like like sanjay says you know don't compromise on your faith if you compromise on your faith then you being there is absolutely no use you will not be a light you will be an added darkness in that place okay so yes you can be in these industries you can make a lot of money there's nothing wrong to make money okay paul writing to timothy says um, the love of money is the root of all evil doesn't say you can you shouldn't earn lot of money you can earn lot of money but don't use it to just be gain more and more for yourself but use it to invest in god's kingdom okay it says you can make a lot of money and pour it into god's kingdom pour it into god's work but however it's important that we need to stand and abide by the standards of god's word even in these industries okay we stand by god's ethic his values uh, his standards of god's word okay so assume that you are in the fashion industry you like to fashion clothes and maybe you are designing clothes for women what does the word of god say does it talk about clothes does the bible talk about clothes what kind of clothes to wear yes uh, first timothy chapter 2 verse 9 and 10 teaches us that a woman should wear clothes that are modest virtuous and professes 
godliness. So that even the clothes that we wear should show godliness, should be modest, it should be virtuous. Okay. So when you are a fashion designer, you can design clothes that are virtuous, godly, that is not compromising your faith, but you're standing on that faith. Okay. So in almost every industry, every career, whether it is you're a pilot or a teacher, in every industry there is sin, okay? But, you know, there is corruption. Uh, people are not doing the right things. Doesn't mean that we quit and go and sit in Himalayas or sit in some forest and live a righteous life there. No, you stay there, but you make a difference. You become the light. You become the uh, priest. You become the royal priesthood. You become Jesus in that place and you, uh, you know, bring in God's values, his presence, his standard, his kingdom ethics and the kingdom God, you usher it and you bring it out in that place. Okay. So this is about how, you know, the first principle, how we can recognize God's will by using God's word. Okay. So you don't have to run to anyone to know what is God's plan and will, what God wants to do at any season. Just take God's word, read it. God's word just speaks. He reveals that to you. You know, ever, uh, I think from my teenage days, I've never gone to people. I've never asked anyone, what do you think I should do in this situation? What do you think I need to do in that situation? From my very teenage years till now, I've always gone into the presence of God and God's word has always given me the answers for anything in my life. Any question, any problem, any difficulty, any challenge, any sin, any step I need to take, God's word speaks. And it speaks so powerfully, it can just hit you. You know, it is just so powerful. Just the last two, three days is going through so much of challenges I didn't know which route to take, what turn to take, which road to take. I just opened the Bible and there, you know, words just leapt out of scripture. God is saying this, 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 this. And I got answers for everything. Just clarity. And when it comes from God's word, it is just so powerful. So don't run to people. Of course, God has people in our lives. We can ask them. But even when people speak over your lives, tell you, you need to go back and see if this is aligning uh, to what God wants you to do, to do. God will confirm it through his word. Even prophecies that you receive should be tested by God's word. So God's word is your standard, is your principle. Amen? Okay, any questions? Any questions before we move on? Yeah, please come up in front and uh, the mic is here because the online students can hear you. Uh, one minute, please. The online students also have to listen to your questions. So it'll be nice if you can please come up in front here. Sorry for the inconvenience, but thank you for your questions uh, and for engaging the class. But you can, yeah, thank you. Thank yes. you so much. You can keep the mic closer so they can hear. Yes. yes. As of now, we got to know about the will of God. Okay. Perfect will of God. And you also spoke about the word of God. Sorry. Right? Word of God. Word, word, word of God. Word of God. Yeah, that's correct, right? As of now, we just understand about the will of God. Perfect will of God and word of God. We learned about the good, acceptable and perfect yeah. will of God. And how do we know God's will? How do you know it's all? Uh... How do you know God's will? That's what I'm saying. We know God's will through His word. So we are we are saying God has a plan, a will, a dream for our life. How do we know? We are going to look at nine different ways. The first way we can know God's plan and will for our life is through His word. My question is: My question is in Romans uh, twelve verse two. Twelve verse two and Ephesians or something five. Ephesians. Yeah, Ephesians five verse ten. Okay, Ephesians five fifteen to seventeen, and Romans twelve to uh, two. Here it mentioned in uh, Ephesians five to fifteen, it mentioned about the will of the 
Lord. Okay. Sorry. Will of the Lord. Yes. Will of the Lord. Ephesians five verse ten. You are saying. Five fifteen to seventeen. Where is that? The starting. Okay, starting. Okay, okay. yes. Here it uh, all about that will of God, Lord with us. Okay, will of will of Lord. It's mentioned about will of Lord. Yes. And Roman twelve fifty-two. It uh, mentioned about the good will of Lord. So, what is the exact difference between will of Lord and perfect will of Lord? There is no difference. But the will of God, will of Lord and yes. will of here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17 says, we need to not be foolish, but we need to understand the will of God. And how is God's will for us? God's will for us is good, acceptable and perfect. So just giving the adjective of the will of God. The adjective for the will of God is how is God's will for us? Good, acceptable, and perfect. What is your name? Wiki. So if I say Wiki, okay, when I say Wiki, uh, in uh, for stu are you listening, Wiki? Yeah. When I say Wiki for the students, for different students, it will come different things in the mind about Wiki. But I'm saying Wiki is uh, a student who has uh, curly hair a student who has a beard a student who is uh, who is engaging in class ask a lot of questions i'm actually what am i saying i'm talking about your characteristic i'm talking more about wiki so here it's talking about the will of god but the will of god is good acceptable and perfect but in roman it's mentioned different one kind of thing that is renewing the mind Sorry? renewing the mind yes why you tell me why, because I, no, no, I no. thought why. Yeah. So, why do you need a renewed mind? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Because if a person come up with the will of God, if a person come up with will of God, but why he needs renewing his mind or heart? Only if you have a renewed mind, then only you will be able to know the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. Yes. So if you have a mind that is carnal and fleshly, okay, you will not be able, even if God reveals his will, you will not be able to understand his will. But if you have a renewed mind, which means a mind that is able, what's a renewed mind? What's a renewed mind? A mind that is able to know the thoughts and the plans of God. Sorry? A person doesn't have everything. Okay. Yes, it's a good question. Why he needs a renewed mind is because sometimes your desires, most of our, our desires can be in two categories. A desire can be fulfilling the worldly, fleshly desire or our desires can be fulfilling God's desires. So if your mind is not renewed, your mind is following the old lifestyle, your sinful nature, right? How you were living in sin. And your mind is trying to please your sinful nature. So your desire and your will is to satisfy your old sinful nature. That is why the Bible says we need to renew our minds. Why? So that we will be able to live according to the spirit and understand and know what is God's will for our life. Now, understand this. Not only God has a will for your life. What is his name? Uh, Vicky. Vicky, God, not only does God have a will for your life, you also have desires and will for your life. Satan also has a desire and will for your life. You know what is Satan's desire and will for your life? What is Satan's desire and will for your life? It's not a complicated question. What is Satan's desire and will for your life? Yeah, to steal, kill, and 
destroy. Thank you. Get through. Satan's desire for your life is to steal, kill, and destroy. Your desire for your life is to follow your sinful nature. So, if you don't have a renewed mind, you will be living according to your sinful nature. And what is this, what is the end of your sinful nature? Eternal death, no fruit, hopelessness, disappointment. But in that, how can, God is not going to say, hey, come here, this is not, you should be doing this. God is not like that. So how do you know God's will? How do you know what is God's desire for your life? You need to have a renewed mind. How do you have a new, renewed mind? What is a renewed mind? A renewed mind is a mind that thinks God's thoughts, think God's ways. Not Satan's thoughts, Satan ways. Not worldly thoughts, worldly ways. Okay? And how can you renew your mind? When you read God's word. Because God's word tells us what is right and what is wrong. Does that help, Vicky? Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, all Daniel says, after confirming from the word of God, how can we get final confirmation that something is correct or incorrect? Because many times we are still confused. Like when we are choosing a career, we first check it from word of God. After that also, we are left with so many career options, which are according to the word of God and pleasing to God. So confusion, so there is confusion. So you're difficult to make a decision. Am I correct or not? Yes, you're absolutely right. So that is why we don't have just one guidepost. We have nine guideposts. So, you know, after we look at the word of God, there are other guideposts that will also confirm if this is God's will for your life. Okay. But, and uh, to understand that, you need to have a renewed mind because you're able to prove and test it's important for us to prove and test and examine if this is God's good, pleasing, acceptable will for your life. So it's not just the word of God, it's other guideposts. And we will look at the other guideposts as well. And then Daniel, you'll have more clarity. Okay. Yeah. Charles says, you know, in Psalm 119 verse 19, uh, how shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed according to his word? Okay. Thank you all. Anyone else has any questions? Thank you, Vicky, for the questions. Actually, important, good questions. Thank you. Okay. If there are no questions, we have just some more time. We look at the sec. We bring in the second principle: recognize the seeds uh, in your life. Okay. Now, God works according to the seed principle. I want you all to listen carefully and understand, okay? God works according to the seed principle. What is the seed principle? Have you all seen seeds? Beej, dekha hai, beej, sabne, okay? Now, when you take a seed in your hand, how does the seed look? Small, lifeless. It doesn't have any potential, dormant, cannot promise you anything. It looks just very dead, right? You just keep a seed in your hand, will it just grow into a plant, suddenly give you fruit, whatever fruit you like, mango or grapes or uh, lychees or strawberries, it will not just automatically just come, right? The seed in your hand looks dormant, lifeless, does not give you any promise. It looks like a dead thing. But you take that seed and put it in the ground, okay, nurture it, pour water, make it grow. What happens? The seed germinates into a plant, then it begins to grow, spring up. You keep, you know, pouring water, you take care of it. It then becomes a, a big plant or a big tree. And it bears a lot of fruits and flowers that you can enjoy. Okay, so the seed was able to do what it was supposed to do, and it was a bless, and it's a blessing to you. The same way, you know, many things that God works in our life is according to the seed principle, or like this, the pattern of this seed. Okay, the seed looks lifeless. Okay, it might seem lifeless, it might seem dormant, it might seem dead, no potential. Okay, but it has potential. It can promise 
and bring about things when it is planted in the soil, when it is nurtured, it can bear fruit. And many of the things that God does in our lives follows the seed principle or the seed pattern. Okay, so what do we mean? You know, when God initiates things in your life or when he starts things in your life, it will be like a seed, very small. When you look at it, you don't see a big, you, God says, I want you to be a pastor. You don't see a big church, a big uh, auditorium, people filled in that auditorium. Suddenly you don't just pass out of Bible college and go to that auditorium and be a big preacher with a church of 5,000 people and all of those things. No, it's a small thing, right? Like a seed, you know, um, it might be small, it might be insignificant, it might seem lifeless, but God wants you to take that seed and work on it, work hard, labor, you know, toil, and then you will come to a place where you'll have this big church, where you see yourself as a pastor of 5,000 or 10,000, the dream comes true, okay? So God initiates things like the seed principle, which is small, insignificant, you know, but it has full of life, it has full of promise, it's full of potential. But what do you and I need to do? We need to recognize it, we need to nurture it, we need to build it up and grow into something that will bless people. So you pass out of APC and, you know, you have this prophecy, people have prophesied over you, you're going to be a pastor of a, a church of 1,000 members, 5,000 members, I, I see you preaching to big audiences, you see that in your dreams and your vision, you step out of APC and then you go and your pastor says you have to work under me. Okay, so you're not even a pastor, you're an assistant pastor in a small church where we were on 5,000, it's only 50 members and your pastor is saying do this, do that, go here, go there, did you finish this, did you finish that? They're saying, hey, this is not the dream I saw, this is not the plan that I saw, okay? But God's works in the seed principle. It can be small, insignificant, but God wants you to plant it, nurture it, build it. Does a seed take five minutes to grow into a big plant and give you fruits and uh, flowers? No, it takes years, right? It takes years for a plant to yield its fruit uh, or it yield its flowers. Sometimes it takes even months, okay? So we look at examples in God's word where God's word is, uh, you know, um, is described as a seed. Okay. Now, if you look at the Bible, we see that the Bible itself or God's word is like a seed. Okay. Mark chapter four. Okay. Mark chapter four, Luke chapter eight, Matthew chapter 13 where Jesus talks about the parable of the sower. And he says, a sower went to sow some seeds. And if you look at Luke chapter 8, verse 11, what does Jesus say the seed is? Look, look at Luke chapter 8, verse 11. What, does, what is the seed Jesus is referring to in this parable? What is the word? The seed is compared to the word of God. Thank you. Okay. So God's word is compared to a seed. Okay. We we'll stop here. We'll just have one more minute. Anyone has any questions? We'll continue. Okay. Next class. So I want you to, you know, uh, this week pray just like Paul prayed for the church at Colossae and say, God, I want to be, I want to know the knowledge of your will. I want to be filled with all spiritual wisdom and understanding and also ask God to renew your mind. And how can you renew your mind, fill your mind with God's word? And if you have any problems, any difficulties, any challenges, you know, go to God's word and see how God answers you from his word, okay? Thank you all for joining class. I'll see you next week. Next week, please read chapter one and chapter two to where we finish and come so that we can uh, continue. Thank you, everyone, online students, for joining class. Thank Have you, a blessed weekend.